Hey, Coach, I was just uh, uh, from out of the game. Then I got some uh, a couple of bingo things. Pinion, it looked like he made the – he slowed the returner down on that breakout to, to help with uh, – give Troy a chance to get get back. Yes, he did. Okay. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't have the best direction and coverage. We had a uh, missed tackle. But Troy did an awesome job of, you know, retracing. And, you know, I, we always talk about great plays made from great effort. And you can see his acceleration finishing on the football and giving us, giving our defense a chance to go back out there and play ball. So we got we learned from those mistakes. And we have a great opportunity to get better this week versus Cincinnati. Did that, what did that show about Troy's athleticism, perhaps? Because I think that's one of the things that people have really talked about. Go back to what? Him in high school and college, he played multiple positions. But the biggest thing that stood out on that play was his effort. And that's – you saw, like, some guys, they could just turn around and just run to the ball. But you could see his intent to get to the ball carrier and his effort. Because, yes, he does have speed and acceleration. But it, if you don't have the effort, then that kind of goes as a wash on that play. So you, the biggest thing that stood out was his effort on that play. How far did he come from? Did y'all watch that on the film? Did y'all count the yards? I don't count the yards on that. We just make sure we can make the tackle. Okay. Yeah. And you I, can do that, though. You can yeah, check gonna, that out I'm for me. Yeah, I'm going to see where you're talking <laughs> Oh, yeah. About Appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, how is, uh, you know, Avery, again, some good, good returns. Looked like he was, you know, a step off from uh, going. And it looks like uh, the Bengals, uh, I'm hearing Huber, the same times aren't that good. Might have to be some opportunities for you. Well, I'll say this about Cincinnati. They do a great job on all their phases on special teams. It starts with Darren Simmons, special teams coordinator, has been there for about 20 years. He's learned, he's, he's played the game. He was a punter coming out, Juco, and playing at Kansas, and he's been a special teams coach ever since. He does a great job with all their guys, and when you talk about their kicking and punting, particularly their punting, Hubert does a great job of directional punting. So they're trying to create manageable space for the returners and then their gunners, you know, Trey Flowers and Stanley Morgan, they do a great job of winning downfield and coverage, forcing fair catches or making plays on the football. So it's going to be a big challenge for us this week when it comes to their punter, their pump protection, and then their gunners and coverage. And it's our job to make sure that we're, again, swinging at the right pitches, making sure that we're returning the right footballs, making the right decisions. But first and foremost, make sure we have the ball in the next play for our offense, D-Led. No, it's only – it's still a relatively small sample size, but 18 yards per punt um, return, that's pretty good. What's working well in that operation? I think it starts, one, it starts with our coaching staff. Um, you know, Coach Stephen King and Coach Steve Hoffman, they do a great job of, you know, helping, helping me out when it comes to understanding the game plan, understanding what we're going against. And our players, first and foremost, they do a great job of, you know, understanding the game plan and then going out there and being able to execute. We have a lot of room for improvement when it comes to the punt return game plan, when it comes to returning the ball. And we talk about not only is Avery the playmaker out there, we have 10 other guys that are out there, whether we're trying to force a bad kick to create less hang time for the punter to give more room for our returner to operate with or blocking at the line of scrimmage. You know, my, I, when I first started coaching, my first couple of years in co uh, coaching college football, I coached D-line, and D-line really helped me as a coach because it really starts with the line of scrimmage. If we're able to win at the line of scrimmage, then it helps us later on in the play. So if we can win early in that down, when we talk about punt return, it only sets up more yards for our returner. And we want to just gain first downs for our offense. If we are able to take a first down and gain one or two first downs for our offense, uh, when it comes to that, then we could give our offense, you know, more less room to work with, and then. And it's easy, that percentage of scoring creates a higher percentage for our offense. If that makes sense. Yeah. Why did you guys? Or what did you guys like about Pinion? You had some choices. It felt like bringing in another punter. What, what were the things that drew you to him? We, you know, first and foremost, his leg strength, athletic ability, um, his accuracy. When he talk about punt direction. Uh, being able to hold, being able to kick off. He's not just a punter. He could kick off. He could actually hit, he could hit field goals. He's done it in games before. And he's a leader both on and off the field. And he's just an overall good human being, good person, leader of men. So all those things we took into account and consideration when it came to, you know, looking at who we wanted to bring in as a punter. And he's been doing a great job ever since. So we're very happy to have him in the building.
After what you guys went through last year, you had so many hunters over the course of the year. Just to have that stability, has that been an asset for you over the first six games? Oh, for sure. It, without a doubt. It helps create continuity in that room when it comes to, you know, all three of our specials being able to operate at a high level, whether we're talking about the punt operation, snap and punting, or even field goal when we starting to involve coup into the mix when it comes to that. And then with our kickoff team. So you can see that, you know, having that continuity and having that stability in that room with the punting position really helps us on multiple phases. With going back to Pinning and Birmingham here, how much of that decision was having a guy that could kick off and how much of that went into maybe saving coup, you know, kind of keeping coups like fresh for field goals? I mean, there's always consideration. We're always looking for the best available option for our team when it comes to the, the punting position. First and foremost, we're looking for a punter. If he can kick off when we're looking like in that offseason phase, that's a bonus for us because we know that Koo can kick off and he has the ability to help us, and he's done it years prior. So having a guy that can't kick off it is a bonus for us because we know that Koo equals points. A phrase that you've uh, trademarked. <laughs> no. Nah. Just that's what he, he kicks field goals. Field goals equal points. That's part of offense for us. <laughs> you can turn that into a shirt, though. Or... <laughs> <laughs> All good. Anything else? Uh, this is maybe very minute. I don't know. But with Darren Hall likely playing a whole bunch more defensively now, how mm -hmm. does that change maybe some of your rotation on kick coverage? It, it doesn't really. Again, we're going to play the best available guys out there. If they can help our team, you've seen Lorenzo Carter, he's been out there in punt return helping us out. Troy, even though he started on defense last week, he was one that made the tackle on, on punt coverage. So we're going to play the best available guys. We still have an understanding too of like, we don't want to wear guys down when they're playing a lot of reps on offense or defense. But if it's a fourth down play and we're able to, you know, I always look at it like this, you know, in defense, if the offense is going for it, that's a guy to have a situation. Well, it just so happened to punt the ball to us. I still feel it. We still feel in our like in our room. That's a guy to have a situation. Just so happened we have a great opportunity to get the ball and turn that play into offense. So whether it's a defensive back, an outside backer, you know, fullback, running back, we're gonna play the best guys out there because the most important thing is being in the present and winning that down, that that current down that we're in. So I yeah. do you have a, a couple of other Ohio questions. Oh my goodness. Well, your high school coach is retiring. He is. Well, I've got a game tomorrow night. What, he what's is. He mean, what, did, what did he mean to you? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, it, the, the best way I can answer that is I had him not just as a football coach, but I had him as a, um, a teacher. And he taught um, Chaucer Shakespeare. And he, uh, you know, senior year, you have it. So you think, ah, oh, you got your high school coach as your senior year. This will be easy. Uh, didn't say ever talk about football. He was a teacher first. Um, he's the best I've ever seen in terms of being around young people, uh, high school age, and being able to get all of them motivated without, he's not a very big man. And guys used to tape record the, um, his speeches at halftime or before the game and like listen to him on the way in. He's a powerful speaker, great with the English language. Um, but he had a way about him that, um, Obviously, he's had a ton of success for a reason, but uh, he means a great deal, not just to me, but really anybody who's ever played there or was in any of his classes. And I respect the man so much just because of, he put the person first, you know, he taught you a lot, but I obviously try to carry forth some of the things that he instilled, even though, you know, I had no idea at that point, you know, I would go into coaching, um, but he was a great role model. I know he's, um, he's affected in a very positive way a tremendous amount of people. Um, and I was just grateful and honored uh, to play for him. You, you, you mentioned just a few different things there, but is there one memory for you? I don't know whether it's football, football, football one or a Shakespeare class one that, that stands out kind of more yeah, I mean, we, than the rest. The memory probably was at the, the unfortunate last game of the year. We're playing Kent McKinley um, for the, in the final four. And we were up, I think, 19-6 in the fourth. And... Um, we ended up losing that game. And obviously it was senior year. A lot of us waited our turn at that time. Um, I think only one player in my four years, or maybe two, started two years on varsity. So we all just waited our turn to play one year. And uh, obviously that game didn't go the way we wanted to. And a lot of us were devastated. And uh, the way he was able to pull us together 
in that locker room um, to a bunch of 16, 17, 18 year olds who are devastated. It was a huge impact because of the way he was able to emotionally connect with you, but also give you clarity that, you know, life's not essentially over and there's so many things to look forward to. And just in that moment of where you're feeling the worst, he was able to, um, to kind of point you in the right direction. And uh, again, I know there's a ton of guys that would stand up in my situation right now to talk about him that would talk the exact same way. Um, I still have a relationship with him today and, um, and it has nothing to do with football, it really doesn't. And uh, I think anybody who would speak of him would speak of his character first. How did he influence your coaching? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, he really, without knowing, um, just the way he carried himself, he, um, he treated everybody with respect. He treated the, rep the opponent with a tremendous amount of respect. Um, always talked about them in the highest regard to us. Never downplayed them. Um, you know, if anything, built them up. And then he always, after games, and we were, look, we were a pretty successful high school, um, to his credit. But after the game, it was always about the opponent and showing respect to him after. And, um, you know, obviously you fight on the football field, but after he was just, he's a man of respect. And I, and I try to, the best I can, um, tremendous shoes to even try to even fill, but um, to try to go along those lines. Man, you got me all emotional. <laughs> all right, we done? Okay, there we go. Now you're, ro you're rolling now, we got Yeah, you. we got something. Who knows what I'm gonna say next? Anecdotally, it Oh, feels there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I went to a Catholic high school. I didn't say I passed all the class with flying colors, man, golly. Anecdotally, it feels like over the course of several years, what used to constitute two-minute offense or hurry-up offense has condensed. Mm -hmm. How is, in your mind as a coach, has the time frame we need to actually yeah, try to get question. into a drive changed? Yeah, I think if you look at games in general, everybody has a two-minute offense, correct? Right? Everybody has a chance to get in the ball. They work situational football. But we're, really when you look at it, I mean, every situation is different, but – if you see how many times you actually get on the ball and run a play without a stoppage of clock, it's not as many times as you kind of imagine, right? So there's incompletions, right? Obviously, there's timeouts, there's out of bounds, right? So the succession in which you're on the ball and running that hurry up, right, differs. But the reality is it's how you attack the two-minute and really how you manage the clock. Obviously, it's everybody's intention to manage it the best of their ability. Um, but I also think when you, you learn from a lot of teams and yourself about how things could have been done differently, or if it's done well, right, why was it done well? I think those are some of the better evaluations of critiquing one's own self or your team or others to learn from when you look at those situations and how teams handle the clock and then how they use their timeouts. Would you have banged a timeout there? Would you have called something different? Did you love the call? Why'd you love the call? I mean, it's actually, it's a fascinating study and we do it, we try to do it weekly in terms of looking at ourselves. Um, but it definitely, it, it's defined differently because when you think about two minutes, you think it's, oh, it's hurry, let's go, let's go, let's go. The reality is there's more stop at your clock than, than one might think in those situations. And, and we still call it two minutes, but it feels like, you know, 45 seconds, somebody, I forget this week, you know, they were, they were buying in timeouts so they could get the ball back with 45 sure. seconds and essentially ran a fully formed drive to get a field goal to 10. Right. I mean, you look at the AFC, you know, Buffalo, yeah. Kansas City last year, right? I mean, that was, what, 13 or something? Yeah. I mean, again, I think what's been, you know, again, you go through situations and you watch how games are so closely contested. And then you start to point out, pick out things of, you know, what was the difference makers? And really it comes down to how you handle – before half, end of game, um, those situations in which you allow yourself the best chance, right, to give yourself the best chance to go score or prevent a score. And I think that's why situational football, I know that term gets thrown out a lot, but the reality is when you really look at how these games are, are played in the NFL, they're so close. Um, the team's offense or defense or staffs that manage it the best and players, more importantly, out there understanding the situations manage the best, you know, usually have the outcome that they desire. Good about Kyle Pitts and his blocking so far this year. He had a block on help me sixteen yard run instead of the Mario touchdown. Mm -hmm. Is that is that idea like what you're talking about, like ideally with what he's been able to do? Because it seemed like that it was that that really like that block is what kind of freed up that whole. Sure. Play. I think, you know, when you talk about Kyle or 
really this has been kind of what we talked about with this offense is that you know guys are asked to do all different things to help the other 10 guys um, there's no difference in that play that you pointed out uh, Kyle with as long as everybody else is doing their job as well as other things that happen in the game you, know, you go back and you and you watch offenses and you talk about us the reality is and I know I've said it and I'm sure coach Smith said the same thing I mean it does take all 11 um, and then there is no well he can't do this or can't do that like the reality is obviously you want to put your players in the best position but we also don't try to put limits on them right and obviously you're trying to keep the defense guessing as well so a lot of those things occur the reality is that was one of you know, 11 players out there that did their job in that play that led to a successful play. And again, that's obviously what we're trying to do every play. You talked a lot about little things and small things. What does that mean to you in terms of what he's been able to accomplish this year? Because obviously, you know, the stats thing. You're speaking to Kyle? Yeah. Yeah, I, again, I, you know me here. Like, I, I, don't, I don't like speaking for others just because of what their intent or anything else is. What I can say is for all players, Kyle included, a level of professionalism, not just the physical. I think that's the one thing that when you see it on film or TV or at the, at the stadium, right, you're watching it, sure, you see splash plays and everything else. The reality is when you guys, you guys have the luxury to come out to practice, and we've talked about this, the first thing we do in practice are fundamentals, and we do them for a long period of time. And I think it goes back to those things, right? You're never mastering the fundamentals. You're constantly working on them. And I think like him and others, right, those are the goals each and every day. So obviously it shows up on Sunday. Was that anecdotally the right response? Did I use that in the wrong term? Okay, just making sure. Yeah. A <laughs> couple consonants. I can't even, don't, the spelling of that would be a little bit. Okay. I shouldn't have messed in the Charles for Shakespeare. Now I'm going to be quoting things, <laughs> Macbeth and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's zoom him in and see, you know, to help me there. Phone a friend. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, when I Google it, I'll let you know. <laughs> Arthur and even Marcus talk about how, you know, this week they were, the team was taking what the defense was giving them. Um, and I'm kind of mapping that onto the fact that I think there was like 16 dropbacks, 14 pass attempts in the game. Do you see NFL defenses as just being more vulnerable to like a power stuff, like a power running game, like you guys are able to execute, or yeah. is that more just the strength of the team? Well, I think that's a good question. I think, and I've said this before, I think each game, right, represents a new challenge for us. Um, we obviously stylistically, forget run or pass, stylistically, there's a way that obviously we want to play football. Um, and we strive for that each week. It just doesn't happen. We can't say, well, last week we played physical and we ran it, well, next week it's automatically going to happen, right? We've talked about this before. It happens out there in the practice field. The reality is what we're trying to do, like anybody on offense, vice versa on defense, is you're trying to attack and give your players the best opportunity to be successful. But you're also trying to take advantage of something you find schematically that you think maybe, you know, could be your advantage. The reality is, though, it's you watch us and you watch, in general, us play. It's, it's more about the intent the speed in which we want to play. Plays, no doubt. I, we, they're plays, I got gotcha. you. But there's also a, a style and brand in which we're trying to represent each and every week. And again, we're trying to accomplish that some weeks better than others. Um, and when it doesn't work or it's not working, we, we obviously try to fix that. But I think it starts there first about how we want to play. And then obviously there, there's X and O and strategy involved, but it's more about the intent in which we want to play football. Oh, do you let nothing? Well, I mean, you're tweeting or texting right now, so obviously, <laughs> I don't know where you're at. I was looking up uh, to see. Uh, no Cleveland questions? No. Yeah. Okay. I was looking up to see who would be up. Ollie Luck, Joe Pickens, or David Groh. Oh, you're at an uh, all time yeah. Cleveland. Yeah. Big Sandy I Christian thought you'd really bring me up a little bit there, man. <laughs> Golly, you think he knows some people. Yeah. D-Let's killing me on Twitter already. <laughs> no, I, I played against Ollie. Uh, yeah. yeah, how about that, right? You're your Twitter app? I'm not. No. No, 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 no. Well, no, I did have something on the video. No. We were, all, we were all doing a set, doing a tribute and so forth. And But, you know, uh, what, um, what are some of the, uh, you know, issues that you all face with the Bengals' defense? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, look, obviously they're not in our division. It was the first time playing them in a while for me. Uh, when you put the film on, you know, what I think they do a really good job of in the defensive staff, and there's a lot of guys in that staff with a lot of experience. Um, 
And I think they do a really good job of is they keep constantly mixing coverage, front structures, right? They make it hard. They don't just line up and say, all right, here you go. They're able to adjust late in the snap count. Um, they're able to apply pressure in all different ways. He's aggressive in the play calling. Um, and it's one of those things where he's got those guys, right? They play a certain style of football defensively, right? They do a great job of keeping you out of the end zone, right? They do a great job of taking away some of your advantages. And by constantly mixing what he does, um, he keeps you off balance. I got nothing but respect um, for what they put on film and what they put on film for, you know, not just this year, but obviously um, what they're trending to in the years um, that led up to this year. And again, it's going to be a tremendous challenge, especially when you don't have a ton of familiarity and we're going into a place um, that obviously is going to be hostile. And so for us, it's the scheme is going to be important of how they play us and, and how we're going to play them. And we're going to constantly have to make adjustments as the game goes on because they do a great job of that. And the safeties, how I are they? I just one deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> follow up. Uh, so then it kind of counts as one if it's a follow okay, up. Okay, one yeah. B. <laughs> follow, yeah, one B. Anecdotally right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. Bon Bill and Jesse Bates, how are they playing yeah. for back, well, back again, in there for the Bengals? Yeah, I think when you talk about – you know, both those safeties. And obviously, like, you got Hilton, you've got the corners that do a tremendous – like, this secondary is very good. I mean, they do a good job of disguising, but they also do a great job of coming downhill. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where we expect them to be physical. There's no doubt about it. They put that on film. It's not that they have to talk their guys up. They're a physical unit. And the front is the exact same way, and the backers do a good job of playing off the front structure. So, again, we anticipate them uh, being very physical in this game and, and – um, we obviously, like I said, we have to take and make sure we make adjustments as the game goes on. The Rams and the Bengals look similar. A lot of 11 personnel, Zach, comes from that tree. Is that, are they similar? Are they that similar when you look uh, at them? Similar personnel. I don't know if they necessarily are similar. Um, everybody's got some carryover from everybody in the league because basically if you see something that you're not stopping, you're going to see it from the next team whether they used to run it or not. I mean, that's just – that's football. Uh, yeah, there's some similarities, but I wouldn't say it's like verbatim that's the exact same th offense that we're facing. No. It's, so is there any carryover from your plan that week to what you think of your – Just carry, it really carry over every week. I mean, you know, there's just – there's always what we call staples. There's always things in your um, call sheet that are going to be in there every week. You just – there's staples. They're just there – they're in there all the time. And then what you got to do is then you got to look at the formations you get, the amount of motion that you get, um, how the speed, the tempo of the game. Are they going to be a no huddle team? Are they going to be a huddle team? Are they quick on the ball? There's just all those things that you take into account then that kind of go to the next group of things that you do on defense and personnel. You know, they got a special receiver, or they got special two receivers, or a special tight end. It's all those sorts of things. So there's certain things that you're always going to call, and then there's always the other half that's going to be specific to that particular team because of personnel and all those things I talked about. How, how does Casey's, I mean, how, Casey not being there really impact what you're going to be able to do defensively? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know because I'll have to wait and see how the guy that, that, that replaces him plays. So, um, like I say, there's certain things that I don't care who's in there. This is what you're going to call that, that w every week. And then there's other things that it does make a difference. You know, you don't want to put – depends on who the guy is also. It, has he played some? Has he played well? Uh, is this going to be his first game playing? All those kind of things take into account what you, you may want to do when you lose a corner or when you lose anybody. How is – it seemed like you guys were really happy with Darren during camp. How is he? What has he done to put himself in a position where you all have confidence in him? Just practiced well and played well. I mean, we played him some last year, different spots, and then, you know, we spot played him this year. You know, everybody's kind of concerned every time you see somebody go in a game that you think because the other guy isn't playing well or something. It's not the case at all. Uh, the good thing about Darren going in the game and earlier games and just coming in for a few plays for Casey or somebody got him ready to play last week. So it's not like the first time then, you know, when he went in last week, it wasn't like the first time that he had been in all year. He'd been in. Same way like when we played Troy. Everybody was worried about, well, is Rashawn hurt or is Michael hurt or somebody else. No, you want to play him so that the first time that you play him, 
you know, it's not like the heat of the battle or they're starting. So I got, I got total confidence in, in Darren Hall. What, you mentioned, Troy, when Mike comes back, whether it's this week or not, all of a sudden you've got, I'm guessing, at least three linebackers you feel really good about. Does that change what you're able to maybe do? And, and, and does that add to some of what you could potentially call? Maybe. Coach, how technically, how did Troy play? We saw the production. He played well. He did, uh, I thought he played well. He made that, that one tackle on the screen play was really a hell of a play because they had some blockers out in front, and that could have potentially been a little bigger play than it was, and he just sifted through there and made the tackle. So he played well. I thought he played very well for, you know, first time out starting. How did, uh, how did um, uh, Isaiah do in his first game back? Really <laughs> well. I last week just having him back the whole time. Not that you know I'm not disappointed in Michael Ford or or D. Alford in any in any way, but just having Isaiah back as a mature presence and mature in what I'm saying is experience. Um, not those other two guys are very mature too and play hard, but it just those guys like you just. Isaiah's been there before, and I thought he was playing really well a year ago at nickel. He was the kind of nickel that I was used to with Logan Ryan and those guys that I'd had in the past that we could I could do a lot with. So when we lost him, I mean, we you guys saw we had a different nickel dag on every almost every game somebody tried it, and it just never was quite. You didn't have the cohesiveness. Well, having him back last week, even in practice, just the communication, the verbal part of it was just so much different. It was, he was, he has been, it's really remarkable. My hat's off to him because not only he, did he rehab his hind end off to get back, the thing of it is is that he didn't miss anything like in meetings. So it wasn't like, okay, well, now he's back. Now we got to kind of make sure he's up to snuff on all the calls. I mean, he went out there and communicated like he'd been there all year. And that, that, that's a credit to him. I mean, I, he, it was really nice having him out there, and I thought he played, played well. You all have uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, takeaways in six games. Is that, I know each one is different, but why do you think that you guys have been effective taking the ball? Playing faster. It's not the scheme. It's not, I'm not thinking up anything or doing anything that makes – the difference is I think our guys are playing faster. You, whenever you play faster uh, – and there's not a lot of thinking involved, which makes you play faster. Guys are getting kind of used to a lot of the stuff that we do. And the faster you play, the bigger the hits, the more you've got guys closer to the ball. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's it really guys that – teams that in generally in the past, if they had big numbers and turnovers, they're usually a pretty fast team or at least playing fast. It doesn't really mean anything by the clock. I've seen a lot of four, six guys played very fast. And I've seen a lot of four, three guys that didn't play fast. So, you know, what the guy runs at a combine and how he plays football are two different things. In training camp, you gave us a passion speech, Cleon. You would call it about not wanting to be mediocre or not wanting to, you know, wanting to be very similar to the defenses you had in New England and Baltimore. At this point, how, how close do you feel like maybe you are to having that here? I don't know. I never compare them. They're all different. Uh, a couple of those teams you talked about are very, very veteran teams. I mean, you start looking at guys I had at New England and Baltimore, I mean, they'd been there forever, and they were very, very veteran teams. This is not a real veteran team. This is still a very young team. Uh, I compare them a little bit more, if I was going to compare them, to probably the one I had in Tennessee, which is a little bit younger, and Rashawn was younger at that time and all that stuff. And, and you know, we made it uh, – you know, we, we did what we did well. You know, we, we could have been better, but uh, they, we still got a long way to go. We got a long way to grow, but I like the attitude of them. I think they bought in. I think they are trying to do everything they can. And, you know, I told somebody this morning, I said, you know, all you can ask of players is know what to do and go as hard as you can go. And, you know, if, those, if you get those two things, you're obviously physically gifted enough or you wouldn't be in the NFL. That's all – 53 guys on 32 teams are gifted football players, or they wouldn't be there, all of them. That's why there's, the league is so daggone competitive. But the difference sometimes is just how smart, playing smart, and then playing 
100 mile an hour and give an effort. That to me is is usually the difference. Once in a while the ball bounces funny, but the, you know one of the things I like about our team is I think they play hard. I think we're trying to play hard and trying to do the right thing. So it's all I can ask of them. Sometimes the other guy's better. Sometimes he's not. So the, the way Arthur's offense runs, a very heavy run, which obviously eats the time off the clock. Has that been? How has that benefited you guys in terms of when they are having kind of the sustained drive that they've had? Well, any any time they're taking time off the clock has a benefit to the to the defense. Any time you get a you're, you're a good, good running team, it's usually going to bode well for the defense because you're you're just not on the field as long. Um, so, but one of the reasons we sometimes we're on the field too long is we still got to do better on third down. You know, we have still got too many third and shorts and that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, like last week, I mean, I think really going into the last two drives, they had 210 or 20 yards or something like that, somebody told me. And then, I mean, they got 130 yards in the last two drives with no points and chewing the clock off. So, God bless you. You know, so <laughs> I just, you know, somebody said, well, you had a 19-point drive. Yeah, that it resulted in no points and eight minutes gone. Thank you. So, you know. In, in, in the context of that, Arthur talks a lot about how statistics can be misleading and how he tries. Oh. So, how have you evolved? How do you approach defensive statistics in terms of how you, in your evaluation of your unit? What do you look at? Points. That's it. As long as we got one more than they got, we win. Points. What else is there? I mean, I know we're ranked way down in the league, who cares as far as yardage? So should I, because of my ego last week, then what there's eight minutes to go in the game and they got the ball on the one yard line, should I now try to pressure them to see if I can increase my stats as a defensive coordinator or am I going to try to call this game to win the game? They had to go twice. They had to score twice. I got to take clock off. If they do score, I need the clock to be gone. I don't want to, okay, blitz, somebody misses a tackle and the guy goes 80 yards and now it's a seven point game. I could care less. Jets game over in London, remember the same thing. Could care less. We gave up a bunch of yardage at the end of the game. I really could care where we end up in total yardage at the end of the year. Could care less. Where I want to be is good in the red zone, good on third down, and good in takeaways, good in the score. Those are the important facts. Because if you're good in the red zone, you're probably pretty good in the score. And if you're good in the score, it means you're winning a lot of games. And then that, you know, third down kind of leads to that too because it gets you off the field. But those, those are so much more than total yardage. Did you have to, as you matured as a coach, is that a lesson that you had to learn? Or have you always felt that way? In terms of no, not, I think, not letting your I think you learn it because when you're younger, your ego always gets in your way. It, it does. It gets it because you want to, oh, you know, you know, hey, I'm leading the league in defense or I'm leading this. It, it's just it comes a point in time when you really kind of realize that really doesn't matter, it really doesn't. And, you know, it happened for me a long time ago because I've been doing it for so long. But I'm, I'm sure early on, you know, I was always checking the box to see where we were ranked defensively to see if – make sure we were in the top ten or something like that. And especially in college, I really did that. But – um, you know, it's just it's as you as you get older, you just realize the only thing that really matters is the score. That, that's what matters. Go back to your point that you were making earlier about experience. Uh, Jalen Hawkins was talking about Eric Harris, uh, I think, on Monday to Dave Archer for 19 on the game, and he was saying that you you referred to him as a man of God, which is kind of more of a personal thing, but also just that he's learned so much from him on how to study, how to take care of his body. Um, how important are players like that, like Eric Harris, Dean Marlowe is obviously another guy that these guys, you know, kind of refer to constantly um, in helping some of these younger players, Darren Hall, who, you know, could have been. Very. That's why I mentioned him, I think, a couple weeks ago. I remember one time I mentioned Dean and Eric about, you know, it's, it's rare to have two backup safeties that can also put their egos aside because they've played in this league and started, and then all of a sudden now they're giving that job up to younger guys, but they're still – mentoring them and, you know it's not like well I'm not going to tell him anything because I want his job well yeah they want his job they want to play but they're also team guys and they also have experience they can tell them things that they've seen or how they've done it in the past those those things are invaluable 
Um, you know, Isaiah was that way when he was hurt with the other nickels. I mean, he didn't sit there and say, I'm not going to tell you anything because I'm going to try to fight and get my job back. He'd sit there. He sits right beside those guys, and they'd be asking him questions, and he'd be telling them. Uh, it's always great to have that, that kind of group with you, whether they're starters or whether they're backups. It's just it always helps the younger players. And trust me, it's sometimes I've gone to players – and ask them to say something to players because it's always different uh, coming from a player. If I'm a player coming from another player than it is the coach. The coach is always on my butt. You know, sometimes it goes through one ear and out the other. You know, it's like when your parents told you what to do, you, you kind of went through one ear and out the other. But if somebody else told you what to do, then it meant something. You know, if you're a parent, you understand that what I'm talking about. If I tell my kids something, yeah, right. If somebody else tells them, uncle tells them, oh, yeah, well, we should be doing that. It's just, it's, um, you know, it's the same way with coaches. You know, if the media tells me how to do something, it's probably going to go through one ear and out the other. If another <laughs> coach tells me something, then I'm actually going to listen to them. So, but that's why the, when, those, when those guys speak, it means something. When Jared Grady speaks to the D-line, it probably means more than coming from me. That's that, that's they're invaluable. If, if Mike comes back this week, does he get the green dot back or is that? We'll see. Hey, coach, just to piggyback, um, how have you seen Jalen Hawkins and Richie Grant's progression over or through these first seven weeks? Well, I think they both have, have improved quite a bit. They're, they're becoming much more verbal, taking charge, much more. Um, and the good thing about those two guys is they're, they're very good students in, in the classroom. Like I say, they don't take anything for granted. Uh, uh, I'll tell you, Coach Hoke and I were hard on Richie last year. We were hard on him. And, and I told him someday call Brandon Merriweather and see what I was like his rookie year when he played safety for me. I said, you know, we see so much potential in you. We're not going to be easy on you. We're not going to allow, you know, just uh, you to make a mistake. And those guys are really taking it to heart, him and Hawk. And I think they're both verbally they're they're far above where they were last year. They can still be better, but they're a lot better than they were and, and progressing all the time. Both very conscientious, you know, really like both of them.